deep down, people are looking for that signal of what are your limits? Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Sean Campbell. Sean, how are you doing today? Excellent. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Excited to, to dive in. A little bit about Sean. He's been training, mentoring, and educating all his life. Um, and he's been a conference speaker, author. Sean has delivered talks to Fortune 50 companies and top-tier conferences. He's also been an author of several books on uh, technical as well as business topics. So uh, just a wealth of knowledge we're going to get here today. Sean, with that said, why don't you give our, our listeners a bit more about your background and then like dive into what your business is actually doing today? Yeah, yeah, sure. So for uh, 22 years now, I've owned services firms. Um, that's not that's not eight. Uh, that's just two. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met this this archetype, but you meet some guy at some what we used to do is in person networking events, but now we do some other way. Yeah. And they'll be like, you know, I've owned five companies over 10 years, and I'm always like. They can't have all been successful. Yeah, is that a good <laughs> thing or no a bad way. thing? Right. You know what I mean? Or the guy's like, I've started six companies and he's yeah. 31. And I'm like, yeah. no, you didn't really start six companies. You started six things, but I don't really know what they were. And um, no, so I had a first company that I grew and sold along with my business partners at the time. There were two of three of us in total, so two other guys. And uh, since 2006, I've owned an organization with a, another guy, one of the original uh, three business partners that we were in the first company. Uh, called Cascade Insights. And yeah. that's what I've been doing, you know, for the last 22 years or so. Awesome. So what is Cascade Insights? What are you guys doing? What's your what's your focus? Well, we do market research for B2B technology companies. So, you know, outfits you've heard of by brand, but maybe you don't really know what they offer because we just do the B2B side. So like we work with Amazon, but we work with Amazon Web Services. We don't work so much with like Amazon's commerce portal. Uh, we work with Microsoft, but we work with the side of Microsoft that sells software to organizations. Uh, we don't work with the Xbox team, much to my kids' chagrin, because one of my eldest is always wants to be a beta tester, and he thinks I have a line on that. And unfortunately, <laughs> I don't. Um, all, all I know is the closest I ever got to like the secret sauce there is I've been in the building that is one of the main Xbox buildings, or at least was until recently, and they have this huge life-size Halo diorama like in the middle of the thing with a warthog. So to anybody listening who knows what that means, that's really cool. And so um, uh, they also have a life-size like uh, Spock, uh, Kirk and McCoy thingamabob mm -hmm. hanging from the ceiling. And uh, I know in that building, there was like an airlock that you had to get like double cards to get into for like all the secret stuff. But, you know, so we're always working with the B2B side of a business and we do, we do market research for them. Uh, and then typically we'll take that research we do and we turn it into something external. So that could be thought leadership, that could be better marketing for them, that could be better sales tactics, you know, whatever it is. But that's that's basically what the company is all about. And we're about we're about 30 employees. Um, um, and oh, I always think one of the most helpful things you can ask somebody that own a business in a, in a weird way, it's not an ego thing, it's just how big it is, because again, it's not an ego thing. I, I don't think of it that way. There's some owners who like every time they get a new employee, it's like accumulating like wealth in a way, like mentally for them. And that's not the way I think about it, but there is real differences between running like a 30 person business, a one person business, a 300 person and a 3000. And, and I think depending on where somebody's at on their journey, um, you, you can get different levels of advice, you know, from that standpoint. Yeah. But anyway, that's basically who we are. Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting. Uh, they they mentioned that for sure. Uh, lot lots of different advice, lots of different experiences at at different levels, uh, with companies. And so, yeah, you're going to get a lot of different answers depending on depending on who you're asking. Um, so you guys are 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 growing uh your business and and helping out other businesses. Um, how do you? I guess first of all, what what are you seeing with companies that that you work with, um, and in your company too, that really help them achieve 
a higher level of success. Is there a couple like key things that you're seeing? I suppose it varies so much, but is there a couple of key things that you're seeing um, with companies and their success? Yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I would say one of the biggest things that we're seeing, even in the research we do um, for clients, I mean, there's only so much I can say about the research, except in like broader strokes, because yeah. typically the relationship is somebody's like, hey, help us understand our landscape and our competitors. And obviously that's a strategic advantage for them to have that information. So, mm. um, you know, it's not like I just can go out and say, Hey, this is what, you know, Microsoft's competitive landscape is based on the research we've done. But what I will say is a general trend across all of marketing initiatives that we see is something I started calling the age of narrow a while ago, because I, I needed to find some way to describe it. And what it was is this interesting set of like, interlocking dynamics. A, nobody trusts content, which is weird to say because we're having a podcast right now, right? Yeah. And, and you know, but but they they don't. They kind of, their, their natural inclination is to distrust content. And that leads to a secondary thing, which is that when they read marketing, they're typically looking to figure out where the offer lacks capability. They're not reading it to be told what it has, right? We long ago left that aside. I mean, that that's 30 years ago where your only source of information was the sales rep. And so, but we went the other direction so far that all of our marketing is so like, we're awesome and we can do everything that when people look at it, they go to Amazon to use a, use a commercial example. And they basically say, okay, I'm going to sort by the worst reviews, not the best reviews. And the reason I'm going to do that is I don't trust the best reviews. Yeah, I do right? that a lot. So, so I'm going to go sort by one star reviews. Or if I go to a website of a provider yeah. and it says it does X and Y and Z, I'm going to go to every competitor site and hope they have some kind of Harvey ball matrix that tells me what this guy doesn't have. Yeah. And and I think the other piece of this is that it, it's driven by consumer behaviors, right? We live in an interesting environment. You, you can now, for really the first time in recorded history, uh, just watch English historical period dramas 24 seven and never have to touch any other stream of content. Or yeah. you could just watch Russian import sci-fi movies if that's your thing or take your pick. And, and this is bled over into the business world now hmm. where they want companies to not just be narrow. People have always liked companies that have a niche, but they want them to explicitly this explicitly state their narrowness. They want to say where the boundaries are on that organization, which is really saying what you don't do. And if and I think what happens these days is a pretty simple dynamic. If you don't say what you don't do in some shape or form, and we could get into that if you want, kind of how you go about doing that. But if if you don't do that, consumer or business buyer will, will just thunder through the internet looking to fill that gap in their knowledge. And they're either going to do it by analyzing a competitor site who's, who now they control the message and you don't want that. Or they go to a third party review site where again, you know, we know people sometimes have an ax to grind when they put up reviews. They're not, they're not authentic a hundred percent either way. Yeah. And yeah. so both, you've both lost, ways, right? right, right. You've lost control of the message. And, yeah. and it's a weird thing. Cause on one level, just to wrap this up, like at least the intro of it, like on, on one level, it's a great thing. I, mm -hmm. I got a 1200 Kindle books. I, I can go order any book from anywhere I want in the world pretty much. And I'm reading it 35 seconds after I click add to cart. I mean, the ability to kind of go into lanes and learn things that are unique is great. The trade-off is I don't think our marketing has kind of evolved to where people's heads are at. And so we're, we're surrendering this, this high ground to everybody else. And I, and I don't think, we should, and we see this everywhere. I see this with other service firm owners that we compete with. I see this with other service firm owners that I don't compete with, but I just counsel. I see this with our clients where in tech, everybody's tech does everything. You know, it never has a limit. And, um, and people are just hungering for this. They're hungering for a degree of authenticity and clarity in the content. And again, the final thing is if you, if you think they're not going to get it, they are. They're just going to get it from somebody other than you. And now you've lost the thread. Yeah. So that's, that's the biggest thing by far that we've been seeing. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, so let's, do, let's dive in. You, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, saying what you don't do, like 
how, yeah, I want to know how you how you do, how you go about doing that. Well, the first thing is, I think you have to be uh, truthful with yourself. There, mm-hmm. there is no offering product or service that doesn't have a boundary. Yeah. You know, it does. Yeah. You, you know, it does. You, you know, there's a world map behind me, right? For those folks looking on video, right? I, we don't do a lot of work in China. We don't. Uh, we'd love to do more market research in China. Our clients ask for it all the time, but we just, we just don't. Um, I can either, when basically faced with that question, do the tap dance that some companies do. Well, you know, we'd like to expand into China. Tell me about, you know, or I can just be like, no, we don't do China. And instantly a couple of things happen. One, great, I can trust you because you'll actually turn down money. Um, that's amazing. That's so rare these days. And so then the next thing out of my mouth of what we do is that like on a different trust pedestal all of a sudden. And this isn't gaming it. This isn't Machiavellian. This is just accuracy. I don't really have a big presence in China. So therefore, the next place I tell you that we do is probably more likely that I'm being accurate. Um, and so that's the first step is knowing where your boundaries are. And, and, if, and if for some reason, I think some owners, <laughs> some owners and leadership teams will probably be challenged by this. If you can't figure out a boundary, go ask your sales team or your product development team or your service delivery team what the boundary is. Because one, I think it's kind of sad if you can't conceptualize one because you probably know it. You just don't want to admit it. Uh, but the people delivering your work, they very much know what you do well and don't do well. So go yeah. ask them if it really has to be that. I think it's kind of sad if you have to, but but you could get that done. Um, and and then how you you put that on the website is you honestly have the courage to be able to say and maybe even lead with these are the folks that aren't a good fit for us. And and these mm-hmm. what that can turn into is one of a few things. It can either turn into geographies that you don't serve. It can turn into uh, personas that you don't serve. Like a lot of products are sold to kind of certain types of individuals and you can kind of amplify some to the detriment of others. Um, It can be certain sizes of organizations maybe that you serve better or worse. Uh, It can also be certain kind of problems that you're not as well suited to solve for. Uh, But, and it doesn't have to be the lead on the site, but I will tell you an interesting thing. Having it somewhere near the top is pretty powerful because again, people are just charging through whatever content you have, trying to figure out what it is you don't do well. And, and I know that's kind of a sad message. I'm not a sad guy. I just think it's, I didn't create this problem. Other people did. You could blame everybody from Facebook to other social media platforms to the political process to uh, 20 years worth of marketing. I, I don't know where you blame, put the blame, but deep down, people are looking for that signal of what are your limits? And there's incredible power in articulating it in one of those ways I mentioned, because whatever they read next, they're going to trust a lot more. Um, and, and if anybody's listening and is unsure of whether they should take the leap here, you know, well, what if, what if I want to do China someday? Well, messaging can change. Once you can do China, okay, well, now your boundary is somewhere else. Okay, we don't do research in Antarctica or whatever, right? I mean, the, you, you, it should be a moving target. You should grow your firm. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you ossify whatever you do and you just never grow. I'm just saying, prove it, put a boundary, and then when the, it's safe to move the walls out a little bit and capture a little more ground, you go ahead and do it. And you're going to be rewarded for that kind of activity. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I mean, people want to hear the truth and they, you're always cautious when somebody says they can give you everything, right? When, right, when right. somebody tells you they got like, oh yeah, we can handle all of that. You're like, can they handle well, it the other, all or the are they other, just going to do well, a really crappy job on everything? Right, well, right. And the other problem with this is that, um, uh, well, could, a few things I'll share through a short story. There was this guy like um, named Paul Logue. He was a VP at HP. And as a much younger seller, I'm 51 now. So this was a number of years ago. I roll in to HP and I'm all excited because I'm talking to this guy in HP, big company. Um, HP was a little bit more of a going thing back then. And so um, I start just, responding to everything he's saying with, we do that. And, and it was, and here's the weird thing. It was accurate. He kept, 
he kept asking me, do you do this? And do you do this? And can you help us here? And I got four or five things, yeses down the lane. And he puts his hand out, which is never a good thing. Client putting hand out is like automatically you're just, you're in the penalty box. And, and he says, I know you want to keep the aperture wide open, but, but I really need to know what you do. That's awesome. And, and what you hear in that story, by the way, is a few things instantly is like, A, not only does he need me to establish boundaries for what we do so he can trust me, but, and this is really sad. To the, to the firm owner or organization owner where you're like, well, yeah, but we really do like a hundred things. Here's the sad thing. You go tell somebody a hundred things, they will randomly remember three. Yeah. Randomly, which is worse. It's not even that they remember the first three. They, if you walk up to an average economic buyer and you say, here's 10 things we do. And you, know, you do that over the course of like a half an hour, right? What's really sad is they will walk away and they'll remember whatever random three resonated with them which is a horrible way to go to market because you know there's things that you do that are more valuable or have a better rate of return that you know are easy to sell the second engagement or the second series of product offerings, whatever it is. And you're relinquishing that by leaving it all wide open. And, um, and I, it's just a matter of discipline. Again, it's a matter of discipline. And I would say it's also to challenge folks, it's a matter of authenticity. Because you know you have limits and your failure to communicate it, frankly, I think is a lack of authenticity. That yeah. People may have umbrage with that, but I mean, because they're thinking of the P.T. Barnum, like all the world's a circus and, you know, yeah. I should just like promote, promote, promote. Yeah. But that ship sailed, man. I mean, you know, people don't want that anymore. So, so if you've got 10 things you offer, it sounds like the best approach would be Tell them the top three things or two things. Just tell them right, the, right. The, what are you really, really good at? Let them know that. Get the business and then look at potentially adding on other services right. as you but, go. But, but, but even in that micro conversation, right? Say something you don't do, either yeah. at the end or the beginning or whatever, because um, I figured this out a number of years ago. It was weird. Like I... I I, I sold more by saying no than I did yes. Like mm. if I if I took a hundred calls that I had with clients and in and in 50 of them, I bothered at some point in the 30 minutes to say something we didn't do, those had a higher like actual rate of return and turning into real deals than the other 50. And it's just because they got off the phone mm. and they tried to figure out what we were not good at all on their own. And in the other case, I just took it away from them. And, and, and as business owners, I think we're kind of trained sometimes and as sales teams to deflect yeah. and not, and not, sure. a, not address limitations. It's, it's kind yeah. of, it, and it's weird. It's hum- because- I think it's just human, right? We're, we're just always, we try to focus on what we're good at. We don't tell people what we're not good at. We just don't no, want no, to. But, like, but, we don't- but, 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 right. But the funny thing is, we all suck at something. We all suck. At I mean, a lot I mean, of I mean we all, we, we all, I mean, we, we all do. Yeah. And so like, and, and here's the weird thing. Like if you, if you drop this down to like a personal level, what most of the time happens when you disclose to a friend or a colleague or whatever, you're not good at this. What is the natural reaction? Well, here's some choices. Uh, choice A, they laugh at you. No, it doesn't really happen. Typically right. Not, B, no. they, yeah, typically, I guess, depends on what you're bad at, but <laughs> maybe, maybe they would if it's something really strange or, or kind of ludicrous, but anyway, so they don't do that. Um, they, they, they don't say anything to you, but they tell everybody else on the planet how bad you suck. Mm-mm. Okay, no, that doesn't usually happen, right? Um, more often than not, a good percentage of the time, they go, guess what? I, I'm actually okay at that. Do you want help with that? And the other percentage of the time, they go, um, I know Bob or Mary. They're really good. You ever want to talk to Bob or Mary? You know, and like, yeah. and so more often than not, disclosing that inadequacy actually leads you to becoming not only a better person, but actually a better business, because now you find partnerships that can help fill those gaps mm. and you can, you can satisfy things. But, but like you said, we're, we're just, there's kind of this genetic disposition that's pumped into entrepreneurs almost from when they start, which is, you know, don't, don't ever disclose anything that we're not great at because that will be the thing that kills us. And I, I, I would say it's the opposite in a lot of cases. Yeah, I think you actually naturally- 
naturally we just want to, don't want to disappoint. Right. And we think that if right. we say we're good at it, we can figure it out. Like we'll figure out how to be good at it. And so then we won't disappoint. But Hey, the North Star Real Estate Conference is back. It's May 2nd and 3rd, and this year it's a bit different. We're gonna be hammering in on multifamily real estate, and we're gonna show you asset management, value add strategies, raising millions of dollars through syndication, and how to find those hidden gems in today's market that are just so tough to find. And one of the biggest things I'm excited to bring you is industry experts that you're gonna be able to put on your team so you can hit the ground running day one, so join us. May 2nd and 3rd at the North Star Real Estate Conference. Look forward to seeing you there. A lot of services firm owners, I shouldn't say a lot, a, a, a decent percentage are populated by a leadership team that has this mentality in services firms where you're basically delivering something that's more brain to brain. It's not a hard good that you're delivering to somebody like a physical product. It's like you're delivering knowledge. You know, it's like the classic attorney kind of thing or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, the th thought process runs like this, and this is the one that I think is not the smartest one to have. Um, we've got smart people. That seems like a challenging problem. If I apply smart people to challenging problem, I can figure it out, even though I've never done it. But the, the, the issue there is, A, I don't know if you're really doing things right by the clients you're serving, especially if that's your default. Like, it's yeah. okay to experiment and try new things. Um, and secondarily, here's another thing from a pure math standpoint. Uh, and again, experiment some, but we're talking about if your default is to just always do whatever's in front of you. Um, you're never going to really have a really great running business because the it's going to be more challenging to, to do that second project because you still haven't figured out how to do the first in some ways. Your yeah. bill rates on the first project are going to be low because you were trying to figure it out. There was probably better work around the corner that you already knew how to do that if you just waited two days, you probably would have had that show up in your pipeline. You know, um, and so I think it's 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 a balance of maturity and patience, too, uh, that that comes into play. So anyway, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, there's there's other opportunities out there, and if you're always taking everything that it comes in front of you and trying to figure it out, you're not ne making probably nearly as much profit margin, and you're well, just well, you're just hamstringing your business, really. Well, right, right. And the way I would say that to people, like there's different litmus tests that you can use. Like we use like, you know, like one litmus test for this first part of the conversation would be look through all the copy in your website. Yeah. Anywhere does it say what you don't do? And the next time you have a sales conversation, here's another litmus test. Have you anywhere in that 30 minutes ever said to anybody, there's something you don't do? Okay. Well, okay. Now you got some issues that you got to go work on. But the one you just talked about would be a lot more, have you ever turned down a project? There are I, some business owners yeah. that they, they they actually the answer to that would be no no like they, right. they literally never have um, or have you ever fired a client like like not mm -hmm. called them up and said you're fired that's counterproductive but have you ever just kind of slowly backed away mm -hmm. and eventually you just disappear into the mist and when they call you're just like nope you are a pain in the butt you are not profitable and what you offer me it simply it's not worth the freight so I'm gonna wait until something else shows up in my pipeline that's better than you. And if if you're not culling clients on a regular basis, I think I have an issue. And, and one thing on that, we actually, um, we don't do this as much now, but like when my business, I mean, at least that we, we still call clients. We don't call them in the way that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, but it was fun when we did it. But my business partner and I, when we traveled a lot more, um, cause that was even starting to wind down a little bit pre-COVID. It has kind of for everybody, but you know, Young entrepreneurs, you're especially 15, 20 years ago, you're flying to client sites a lot more often and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so when we would fire a client, which sometimes might be an individual client in an organization, because the organization was fine, but this individual was just kind of a pain to deal with. Um, we found this uh, bar that was called Vessel that made um, custom drinks, like craft drinks. So, and the, 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 the shtick was, and these exist in other cities, but this one was in Seattle. And you'd walk up to the bartender and you'd explain what you wanted for a drink, right? And you could make it whatever description you want. And then the bartender would kind of make the drink. So like, you know, I want to feel warm and fuzzy, like it's a sunny day on the beach in Hawaii and my toes have been in the water all day. And like you drink it and you'd be like, wow, how did you pull that off, right? That actually feels like that. And so what we started doing when we fired clients, we've done this, did this for a while and then we stopped, we do other things now. But um, whenever we had to fire one, we'd go to the bar when we were on this trip 
you know, at night after dinner or whatever, and we go and say, okay, make us one. And my business partner had this hilarious one where I won't say the name of the person we fired for obvious reasons in case for some reason they connect the dots on one of these, but it was somebody in Microsoft that we no longer wanted to work with. Like we were working with everybody on their team, but this one person, and they were all in the same hallway too. So other people on the team were like, why won't you work with so-and-so like, cause she's crazy. Uh, that's why. And I can't really handle it. And so uh, we went in and Scott is like, um, he says, uh, yeah, uh, I want to drink something that starts out tasting sweet, ends up really bitter and has a sour aftertaste. And it's like I was drinking out of a dirty ashtray. (laughs) (laughs) And so then he named the drink and like we, you know, and we did this for a while. Like we would, we would come up with like, we name a drink for the client we were firing. Right. Now we just give them nicknames, uh, you know, and we, and, and here's the interesting thing I would say as an owner, um, you know, your, your feedback loop with employees is always a little imperfect, right? I mean, in the sense of you, you, you assume you're getting good feedback and you assume you're hearing good things mm-hmm. uh, and you're able to interpret that. But I, I say this with like, you know, this is one of those things I believe to be true, but I've never like sent out a survey on it is I, I think our staff tends to appreciate when, you know, I, I nerf and kneecap a client and take them out of the rotation because I think what it signals is I am invested in this company and you such that I am willing to let a client go if they're that bad. Um, yeah. And what I'm trying to say by that is I think you not only get the benefit from a revenue standpoint of better revenue, better client down the line, but your employees pick up on something really quickly, which is a, if a deal is going so poorly or this relationship so poorly, and it's not our fault, and it's the client, I can go to my boss and say, gosh, I really think we should get rid of these people. Well, you want to know that from like an ROI standpoint as a boss, you don't want them to just slave away in the messages, you know, we'll do whatever they cost, you know, hey, team, you got to suck it up and deal with it. We've all heard messages like this before, you know, the client's never wrong, all this stuff. No, you want your team coming back to you. Now, what's the trade off? Well, you can't fire all the clients. You know, I mean, some of them are going to be difficult to deal with. So that's more of a cultural balance issue. But I think you not only get a positive from a revenue standpoint, but you get a positive from an employee culture standpoint, because they know you will pop that relief valve Mm -hmm. if you need to, and and you'll let it go. And if you haven't ever had the courage to do it, I would just tell you, if you have a business that's even a jalopy, like... I guarantee three days from now, there might be another deal in your pipe that's probably better than that one that you just feel desperate to go take, right? So and if true. your pipe is yeah. so narrow and your resources are so narrow that you really have to take every single thing in front of you, uh, I think you have different problems upstream, yeah. right? You have other problems with your, you, you need enough elasticity in your business that you can deal with some of that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so, so I would say like another litmus test for a business owner would be in the last year, can you look into your accounting system and be like, I consciously decided to stop working with those people. And if the answer is you can't find anybody, I bet you got some losers you could get rid of yep. as much as you like the rest yep. of them. Yep. That makes sense. You said something a while back, um, about evolving marketing and, and marketing is not involved in evolving uh, where people's heads are at. How do you evolve then marketing to where people's heads are at? What, what, are, you do, what are you doing or what can you yeah, do? Yeah, well, I mean, not to belabor the point, but I think a lot of that is is the Age and Arrow stuff. It's like you that that's where you've got to evolve it. You have to be willing to be a little bit more um, open about where your limits are. And at the same time, you have to you have to keep the aperture narrow enough that people will engage with you. Because when people use Google as their therapist, they're looking for narrow options these days. I mean, they're, they're rarely looking for the generalist. It's one of the gives and gets of, of the way people search for things these days. They can find a narrow choice. Yep. Um, and so the more you can optimize for that, the better you are. So I'd say, I'd say really that's, that's the biggest tip from a marketing standpoint. Got it. Got it. Um, let's talk market research real quick. Just, just give me sure. kind of, um, you know, what, why do it and what's it really kind of 
kind of helping? What, what is there certain like more important things to be like looking at with market research on the kind of broad brush, right? And and is there a right time to do it? Is there a certain season of your business you should be doing it? Kind of kind of just let's let's I guess give yeah, a broad yeah, brush yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, season wise, it's interesting. I, I would say there is a point in every business. The point is somewhat indeterminate, and I can unpack that, where the founding team no longer has a really good understanding of, like a visceral understanding of end customers Hmm. and competitor customers and prospects. And the reason I say it's a little indeterminate is it depends on what you sell, right? If you're a lawn care business, well, you might actually stop talking to end customers when you got 10 employees. Right. Because you've all seen these businesses, right? You call, you go to the website and yeah. you talk to the scheduler, and the guy that owns it never shows up at your place, but a crew does your lawn really well. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're already separate. In a different kind of business, maybe you get to 20, 30 people, maybe you get to 40 or 50. Because the minute that founding team has kind of lost visceral touch with the market, they're operating on old data and it almost should have an expiration date like milk. You know, like if, if you're as that, founding team and you're not kind of refreshing your experience of customers, prospects, and competitor customers, you're probably going to start to make decisions about like what my product should look like, what my service should look like, what people like about us that aren't really in alignment with reality. Now, as a shim, before you do research, you can inject yourself in sales conversations on a regular basis. Like I do that. Like we're 30 people, but I show up in sales calls. I show up to coach, but I also show up because I actually want to hear exactly how people are responding to what we're pitching. So then I can help kind of modulate that. And I do the same thing with marketing. I'm, I'm still actively involved in the review of various things around here because I want to see how it's actually generating leads and reactions. So, but, and then at some point, you don't even have time for that as the leadership team. Like maybe you get to hundred people. Well, you don't really have a lot of time for sales calls unless it's like a major key account, right? And then at that point, uh, a phrase market research firms use a lot is don't generalize from a specific. So now you got a leadership team that's having like one sales calls every month and they look at one blog post or one marketing campaign and now they're generalizing from the specific and right there's the danger point. Mm-hmm. And when you get to that, when you start to generalize a lot from specifics and maybe somebody else needs to tell you this, like, hey, Mary, you keep using Pepsi as the customer that explains everything. Is that just because you just talked to Pepsi two days ago? You know what I mean? And that's the only account you talk to? Um, So have somebody check you on that. And then that's the time to start bringing in a market research team. And when we, we, I would say if you summarize the main reasons people use market research, it's really two. It's pain and opportunity. Pain being the lion's share of why they use it. Because they're getting hammered by a competitor. So the competitor is doing a better job, sales, marketing, product, service. Yep. Um, they have done a poor job with their own product or their own sales team or their own marketing team. And they want somebody from the outside to go out, um, do a win-loss study, talk to a bunch of customers, um, help define who's a better sell to point in the market for, for your organization, define a better market segment to tackle. Uh, on the opportunity side, it's a little more positive. It's like, hey, I've got a new product and it's going so well, I want to go in five more countries, but I don't really know the landscape in those countries. So I want you to help me figure that out. Or, hey, I want to do this new product, but I want to shape it right before I start. And I'm so big now that I don't, I don't really feel like we internally will 100% know what the market wants. So I want you guys to go out and do that. And But really, that frame of pain and opportunity has been true ever since we got into the market research business. Um, and the, and the other reason I think pain drives it more is that, um, it just kind of by, by the way, the math plays out, right? If you're losing to a competitor, that's a lot more obvious drain. Like, Hey, I lost a hundred deals last month. I realized something's messed up. Uh, Opportunity is a little more nebulous. Like I'd like to do better when we launch in France is a different decision tree than I lost a hundred deals. Yep. Right. Yep. One is a lot more visceral and you're like, yep. I really need help because I got to go figure out why this went down. And the other one's a little more like an opportunity cost thing. Well, I can make what's about to happen better. But that and, and, and where you see that divide, by the way, is if you looked at our small and mid-market companies, 
while I'd like it if they come to us more for opportunity like research, I, they typically don't. And I think because that dynamic is operating inside the organization where you see more of the opportunity stuff is like the biggest accounts, like the Microsoft and Googles and AWSs we work with, where, of course, they have enough revenue to say, if I'm going to go launch this new offering in six geos, why wouldn't we do research to help get a better ROI? Right. So, so as you go bigger up market, you see more of this opportunity oriented market research. As you go down market, it's more driven by pain. And I don't, yeah. I don't think that's Which right or wrong. Sense. I just, it's just the way, it, just the way it plays out. Well, again, it's, it's just how, how uh, the how humans react. Right. I mean, you're going to, you don't think about your financial situation until all of a sudden the economy is going down and you're like, Oh crap, now what do I do? Right. You, you right, were spending right, right, all right. your money and doing all your day. And, and, and all of a sudden it's like, ah, crap. Now what do I do? It's the same well, thing right, when you're right. losing sales, right? You're losing sales and you're going, ah, crap. Now what do we do? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say again, if you're looking for a litmus test through this, if you're listening and you're like, okay, well, okay. How can I summarize that as a thing I can go check? I would say it's, it's are you generalizing from a specific or is your sales team or your marketing team? So, you know, the last sales meeting you had, your sales team beat you up about three very specific customers you lost. Okay, well, it's fine. I get you lost three customers, but it, are you actually losing 50 more for the same reason? Yeah. That's yeah. the stuff you got to go figure out. And leadership teams can be very victimized by this because for all the right reasons, your team, feels a lot of pain from those specifics. Yeah. But as a leader, you have to back up and be like, okay, but, but realistically, do we have a problem here? And sometimes the only real way to answer mm. that is to do external research. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, if you just focus on that one person's pain point or that one, the one reason that company, that, so yeah, um, you're going to be, you're going to be potentially making decisions that you shouldn't have been making. And you're going right, right, to alienate right. Yeah, your customers. You got it. And you're making investments and in things that, that don't make sense. And, and, yeah. and what, what I, the last thing I'd say in this, what tends to happen is nobody, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mix of things, I think. I think one, the, the leadership, why does this uh, state persist, I guess? Like why, why, do, why do this leadership team walk around with insights that is like spoiled milk? at some point, because it's, it's been a long time since they talked to the market. I, I think part of it's hubris, you know, part of it is like, Hey, I built this company. I know our customers. I mean, we've all seen the speech by the owner like that. Like, you know, I understand the needs of our, you know, okay, whatever, you know, and then you've got um, the rest of the company that maybe doesn't want to fight the fight, right. They're a little, mm. they're a little terrified. Like, you know, they don't want to go in and tell the owner, I mean, who wants to tell a leadership team, they don't know what they're doing. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, right. so, so one of the things we joke sometimes is that like we exist to deliver bad news, right? Like that's why we get hired sometimes is like lower level manager. And this happens a lot. Lower level managers or mid-level managers will say in a kickoff with us, just so you know, the CEO thinks there's no problem, but he's willing to spend money on research. And, and I know what's going to happen when we get to the readout, the CEO is going to show up and he's just going to throw little darts at whatever we've done. And we have to be prepared for that. And, and again, maybe we end up agreeing with the CEO. That's always a possibility. Uh, but you know, we are sometimes thrown into the mix as a market research firm to, to be somewhat of an, you know, I, I joke, we, we show up in our flame retardant suit and they basically just throw rocks at us for a while and, and flaming Molotov cocktails till, <laughs> till one, one side or the other wins. Um, and the way I summarize that to clients lots of times, I say, we'll keep telling the truth to whoever many, however many people you want for however long you want us to. Yeah. We're just here to tell you the truth. You do something with it or not. I can't control that. Um, you know, it's always sad when that happens. You know, sometimes we go into an account and we tell them all this truth that we found. And six months later, they're still they're, making they're the still same mistakes the yeah. they were making before, but, uh, we, we can't control that. I mean, that's a whole different job for yeah. somebody else, but you know. Yeah. Well, Sean, um, man, uh, a lot of good stuff here, but I, we got a couple last questions before we wrap up. Um, first, what's a what's a favorite book that you can recommend to our listeners? Um, favorite book wise, if if I was talking about things that are like for service firm ownership, um, I would do managing the professional services firm by a guy named David Meister. Um, that was really good. 
I'll give you a, I'll give you a couple quick ones too. If I was more of a product firm or a tech firm, I'd read a book called The Hard Thing about hard things. Um, and uh, if I was just looking for just general purpose advice about the world of consulting, there's a guy named Alan Weiss that has the branding The Contrarian Consultant, which is great branding. Uh, and uh, he's written books for years. Uh, sometimes he's got a little too much of an ego and you got to kind of read past that, but he's got, he's got good insights around that. And, uh, I've always appreciated his stuff. So that's a few different, different lanes there. Nice. Nice. All right. So last question before we wrap up, Sean, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Well, it, it's, I'm glad I remembered Weiss because one of the things he says in his books is, the only true wealth is discretionary time. Mm. Um, and, and the longer you own a business, the longer you work for anybody, I genuinely think if you haven't uncovered this truth, like, like really just go sit down and let it challenge you. Yep. Ask yourself if there really is some true wealth other than discretionary time. Now, now and yep. to be clear, I don't mean just like sitting on the beach and having my ties. Yeah. I mean, the ability to choose what you're going to do is discretionary time. That's, that's what that is, yeah. right? So, so the more of it you have, the more good you can do with the world, the more good you can do with your family, the more, you know, you can invest in things that you feel passionate about and that like is your God-given talent, you know? It's the only true wealth we really have. And I think when people hear that from Weiss and when people hear people say that, they're like, Oh, you mean like sitting on my yacht, like Bezos? No, 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 no. That's not what I mean by discretionary time. I mean, I mean, you have time to invest in people and yourself and other things. And so if you're not wired to kind of think about the math of your career that way, um, I think that's a huge problem. Um, the second thing I would say is um, I just, <laughs> I, I mean, this one sounds simple, but nobody does it. Read, read, like read and read and read. And, and I, I, and it was only recently I saw this thing from Warren Buffett of, and you, people may like Warren Buffett or not, like that's not really the point here, but Warren Buffett said the reason he's read so much over his life is it's the best, it, it has the best rate of uh, return investment wise of anything he's ever seen. And this is a guy who like makes all these deals and all this stuff. Because it's just accumulative over time. You know, I'm looking over at my app and my Kindle app open. I have uh, 1,194 Kindle books. And don't even ask me how many hardcover books I've got. And yeah, I've actually read all of them. And so, you know, and, and I find that what happens is it's just, it's not just a book on a book. It's not one plus one plus one plus one. Yeah. It's more like one plus 1.1 plus 1.2 plus 1.3 plus 1.4. And by the time you read that 1,000 book, it's like, it's like a 10x. Yep. Um, and so, uh, and you don't always have to read books, but like, I, I'd say having the patience to read something meaty, not just an Instagram post would be helpful. Uh, so, you know, you can learn from Instagram, but I'd say only so much. And um, so I would say, if you're not really reading on a regular basis, I think that's huge. And I'm going to kind of give you four, because uh, they're kind of related. The other one is, once you learn something, go tell somebody about it. The world has changed over and over again from somebody learning something and somebody telling somebody else what they learned. So don't just hoard it. Like, like my natural instinct when I go read something is I want to go tell other people about it. Not because I think I'm smarter, because I want to share, yep. right? And so that's that's a big thing. And then the final thing I'd say is, um, and, and I definitely want to add this because it kind of shapes a lot of what I just said about reading read stuff you disagree with like that you passionately disagree with like from the the name of the book you already have an opinion of how much you will hate that thing read it and actually bother to read it it doesn't mean that you will actually agree with it read it and agree with it don't mean the same thing yeah. but actually read understand it. it yeah understand it try yeah. to conceptualize it yeah. we have lost that we have lost that. I mean, I rarely, I try to steer clear of making broader statements for some obvious reasons, but, you know, um, we've lost that. 
Yeah. Nobody wants to read anything they disagree with. And it, and it ties back to what I said earlier about age of narrow, right? We all want a narrow queue. Now, entertainment wise, that's probably okay. You want to just watch Russian sci-fi. Okay. I'm okay with that. Like I can live with that. But when it comes time to really educate yourself, if all you can see is stuff you agree with, and, and this is like true in business too, like, you know, um, consciously seek out that alternative and read it. I, 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 you, you cannot help, but one of two things to happen. Either what you believed before will now be more solidified, which, which may be appropriate in that case. Like maybe, maybe the contrary opinion didn't resonate and you're okay. I really believe this is super true about marketing now, or you're changed. And what's so wrong about that? Right. Yeah. And so like, I, I just, so I would say the litmus test there is um, whatever you are consuming for media, books, whatever it is, ask yourself, how much of this instantly I would disagree with just from the title alone. And if you don't have any of that in your life, go get some of that in your life. I think you'll be better for it. That's just, I've never heard that before. And I, I really like it. And I don't know that I've ever done that before, at least for sure, not consciously. Like I didn't go out and seek something that I was like, yeah, no. Usually when you look at that, you're like, yeah, no. <laughs> well, know? it's hard because because even even in business, right? There's there's so much reinforcement around you yeah. to make you keep going down the lane you're going. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so like it, it 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 is a very individual choice. Um but in the end, I, I think we make better organizations and, and better people and all the rest of that because of it. Yep. Yep. I love it. Love it, man. All right, Sean. Uh, look, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, tons of great value. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Where can they reach out? Um, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, Cascade Insights is the name of the company. So if you go look up cascadeinsights.com, you'll find the company. And if folks want to reach out to me, it's just Sean, S-E-A-N at CascadeInsights.com. And do reach out to me if you just you just want to talk shop about like owning a business or whatever. Um, you know, the one place where I don't keep it narrow, because I just like, like I said earlier, I enjoy educating and chatting and talking to people. Um, I'm always happy to just talk about what it means to own a business and growth like it. it separate from that, though, if you are looking for the kinds of things we do, obviously, if you're a B2B tech company. Yep. and you're looking for market research, you know, we're very much in your lane. Awesome. Awesome. Sean, again, appreciate it. You have a fantastic rest of the day, man. Thanks, man. Thanks again for having me on. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. Your rating review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So, uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So, go on to venturedproperties.com, venturedproperties.com, and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So, I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free, I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.